All right, our speaker today is <laughs> Tony Hay of uh, the Rutherford um, yes, Laboratory in the United Kingdom. Uh, Tony attended Oxford and he did a postdoc after his PhD at Oxford at Caltech in the particle theory group. And he joined the faculty at the University of Southampton in 1974. And on a visit to Caltech in 1981, he got intrigued by parallel computing and its scientific applications, which sparked a transition to computer science and eventually led to Tony being the dean of engineering and applied science. That was a mistake. Southampton. But he corrected that mistake <laughs> by going to work for Microsoft uh, for 10 years as a corporate vice president supervising their research. And since 2015, he's been the chief data scientist at the Science and Technology Facilities Council in uh, the UK. Now, Tony has been the author and co-author and editor of various books, including an influential one on gauge theory. And uh, just last week, the new edition of the Feynman Lectures on Computation, which Tony edited, uh, was published. So this is a timely occasion for Tony to tell us about Feynman and computation. Tony, okay. Thank you very much, John. Yeah, it is nice to be back here. Uh, although the weather is quite what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> and the jacaranda trees aren't out. So it's a little disappointing in that respect. Um, yeah, and when it's the new edition, uh, they're sitting over there. There's John is the new part of this and, and Eric Jolsness, who was a TA on the course, is, is, is also providing a, uh, a contribution. And the last contribution is currently in, in Hamburg, so he couldn't come. So um, yes, so I'm gonna start off by some light relief, telling you some of Feynman's long-term interest in computing and the other connections he had. And, and uh, uh, I'll try not to tell too many Feynman stories because you've all heard them all probably, uh, but I'll tell a few. Uh, and uh, then I'll hand over to John, who will tell us uh, what's happening in, in quantum computing, which Feynman was one of the initiators in 1981 uh, at, a, at a workshop in MIT. So um, Feynman and computation. Well, he did his PhD in Princeton with uh, John Wheeler, as we'll come back to later. Uh, and then he was recruited to work in Los Alamos. Uh, and uh, he did computations in Los Alamos, all types of computations. And in particular, they started early morning. He was one of the early people who went to Los Alamos. And uh, Hans Bethe, who was the eminent German physicist who uh, eventually got the Nobel Prize for explaining the reactions in stars, um, was the, the head of Oppenheimer, made the head of the theory group. And uh, he, he, he hadn't got anybody to talk to. So he came and found Feynman. He was there. And so Feynman, he used to have uh, computational duels because they were both very good at remembering how to do things and how to to take squares and how to divide things and how to do integrals. And they used to challenge each other every morning. And people used to say, it's the, the battleship and the mosquito, because Feynman used to be dotting around, say, no, you can't, but that's stupid and all that sort of stuff. So um, he did the same with Niels Bohr too, but that's a slight distraction. Niels, Niels Bohr was known as uh, Mr. Baker. And uh, Mr. Baker insisted on talking to Feynman before he talked to the big shots. Uh, like Oppenheimer and the others, because Feynman didn't care who he was talking to, he was just focusing on the physics. So what Feynman, uh, Beta made Feynman the youngest group leader in the theory uh, division, and uh, he, as they got closer to producing the bomb, they needed, for the uranium bomb, it was straightforward, but the plutonium bomb was, was much more complicated to make the reaction, and they had to yeah. do an implosion. And so you had to put charges around uh, the plutonium and you actually had to set the charges up and it would compress it to critical mass. And uh, what, what happened was that uh, Beta had put someone in charge of the computing group to do those calculations to calculate the energy released in those sort of um, 
situations. And uh, it, it happens with computers. Uh, people get obsessed by the computing and the boss of that group suddenly got absorbed in the challenges of computers. Uh, and I should say they weren't computers as we have them today. Uh, and, and the group was dysfunctional. So um, the IBM group, it was called, because they've just got a load of new IBM machines, but they were, they were not computers. They were multipliers, adders, sorters, collators, all those sort of things. So they weren't really computers. Um, and in the nine months before Feynman took over, the group had only managed to do three of the calculations they needed to find out what the optimal way to do the, the implosion. Uh, but Feynman, being Feynman, had talked to, uh, to the people in his team, and they had no idea what they were doing. They were just very bright. They were just told they had to do this, they had to do that, didn't know what it was for. And so Feynman got permission from Oppenheimer to explain why it was important and what they were doing and why it was critical for the bomb and stuff like that. And the result uh, was a complete transformation. The team actually worked uh, day and night and began to offer their own ways of improving things. And uh, instead of taking nine months to do three problems, they did nine problems in three months. And so how did they do that? Well, it was an early version of parallelism. So it was parallel computing. So what they managed to do was to do three or so calculations at the same time by taking the deck of cards from this machine to this machine and the next problem came on and you could do pipeline like, like builders building a wall. You can only get so many, but you can actually have several of them laying bricks at the same time. So uh, that was how they solved the, the bottleneck in the calculations. Uh, uh, and then the, it, it turned out they needed a solution for the final test of, of the Trinity test of the plutonium bomb they needed a solution in much shorter time. And you see, it looks like they, you got, you got nine problems in three months. It looked like you could divide three months by nine. That was the time for one problem. But it wasn't quite like that because they were doing several problems at the same time. But they wanted one problem done faster. And that was a difficult problem to do, which they managed to solve. But Feynman was away at the time because his wife, Arlene, was in Albuquerque and, and, and she died in that time and uh, they just finished the calculation they told Feynman to go away uh, and they had done the calculation in time for the, the test and so this is the test that's the plutonium bomb and you can visit the site two times a year once around Easter and then once in the fall and uh, they tell you it makes a thing called trinitite it's the um, molten sand and they say, please don't take any away with you because it's very expensive to make. It's their standard, standard joke, right? Okay, so that was Feynman really uh, showing that he, he really cared about calculations. He had all these tricks with integrals that, that uh, he, he and Beta had, had got together. And he also learned from Beta that if you were doing a theory, the ultimate test of a theory was com comparing it with experiment. And so that was a critical thing. That he, he learned many things from Wheeler at Princeton, but, but really the critical thing was if you're doing a theory, you have to compare with experiment. And um, he had these ways of doing Feynman diagrams, which I'm sure you've all heard of, and certainly I did when I was uh, a grad student, uh, relativistic electron scattering. And the problem is the Dirac equation uh, predicts negative energy states and positrons. And it's, it's inevitable, instead of a single particle equation, like Schrodinger equation, it's a multi-particle field theory. And how do you deal with it? Because there's these virtual things can pop out and come back and so on. And, and uh, it became very complicated. But Feynman had been thinking about quantum mechanics as summing up all the possible paths. And that was one of his major contributions, in fact, to modern physics was actually the path integration, path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. Uh, and uh, if you regarded positrons as negative energy electrons going backwards in time, you could actually include the motion of a positron. So just by including all possible paths, uh, you could deal with them all at the same time. It was like there is only one electron and it's scattered backwards in time and forwards in time. And, and by putting them together, you could actually get uh, the equivalent of dealing with these virtual positron loops 
as well as the scattering. And so that's, that's what Feynman talked about. And he had initially a, uh, a, a very humiliating experience that there was Schwinger uh, and he were the young stars and Schwinger had tried to explain quantum electrodynamics and he did this in a very polished way with means functions and all sorts of clever technologies. And it was a very polished thing. And, and Feynman started talking to about his negative energy electrons traveling backwards in time and, and so on. And they had all these people like Pauli, Bohr, uh, and, and people in the audience asking questions, what about unitarity? And Dirac said, you know, isn't it, doesn't it violate the Pauli principle and things? And it was difficult for Feynman to answer those questions. So he, he ended up very depressed after that particular um, experience uh, uh, and realized that he, he said his machines came from too far away. So um, he did eventually get it right, thanks to Dyson. Dyson explained by sitting in a Greyhound bus all the way from uh, San Francisco, he was at Berkeley, uh, back, back to where he was at Princeton. Uh, he couldn't do any work, it was too bumpy and he couldn't go to sleep. And so he just spent time thinking about, it. he'd been on a course on Schwinger's, so he understood Schwinger, he'd driven out, with Feynman to Albuquerque on the way. So he'd listened to Feynman explain these things and he was able to put it all together. And so these Feynman diagrams, see that, that includes both the positrons and the electrons. It looks a very simple thing, but it actually combines them both. And it was uh, a very nice thing to be able to use. Uh, and people used to, uh, when they first saw Feynman diagrams, uh, they used to explain uh, by talking about Green's functions and all these things and the things that Schwinger was doing and then say you can do it this way and it was one of Feynman's original group at Los Alamos a guy named H.J. Ashkin who actually was the first person to suddenly say well we just do it he didn't bother with justifying it he just used Feynman's methods and everybody else has since then so the one story I would like to tell which is in Feynman's Nobel Prize talk is is about when Feynman really felt he'd won the Nobel Prize for this calculational toolkit of Feynman diagrams. And it, it, it was in 1949, there was a meeting in New York of the APS, and uh, a young scientist named Murray Slotnick was getting up presenting a paper, electrons scattering from neutrons, the neutron can sort of associate into a, 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 a pi minus and a proton, and, and the, the photon can interact with the pi the pi minus, for example. And so you can do this calculation with loops of these things. And so Slotnick had looked at two forms of coupling of the mesons to the, to the uh, neutron and found that they gave different results. And so he, that's what he explained in his talk. And after his talk, the great Oppenheimer got up and said, well, I'm sorry that your calculations must be wrong because they violate Case's theorem. And poor old Slotnick said, Sorry, I've, I've never heard of Case's theorem. And, and sure. Oppenheimer was very kind and said, well, you can remedy your ignorance because Professor Case is presenting his theorem tomorrow. Okay? So you can imagine Slotnick crawled off the stage, all right? Uh, and it was slightly uh, humiliating for Mr. Slotnick, I'm sure. But anyway, Feynman couldn't sleep that night in New York. So um, he decided to try and do Slotnick's calculation using his new methods. Which he hadn't applied to this pions couplings and things, but he had to do some work. But but he was able to do it, and he sought out Slotnick next day and said, "Hey Slotnick, why don't we compare results? Because I've checked your calculations last night, and I've got some results. We can see if I agree with you." And Slotnick was very suspicious. What do you mean you checked my calculations last night? It took me six months. And and you see, I'm, I've got these methods. See, right? So Slotnick was not reassured by that. So they compared them, and Slotnick said, what's Q? And he said, oh, it's Q, it's the momentum transfer, all right? He said, but it took me six months to do Q equals zero. But I said, don't worry, I can put Q equals zero in mine. <laughs> and so he did, and he agreed with Slotnick. So when Case presented his theorem the next day, uh, that, that day, later that day, um, he presented his grand theorem. Feynman put his hand up at the back and said, uh, uh, your theorem must be wrong. I checked Slotnick's calculations last night and I agree with Slotnick and sat down. And as you can imagine, people said, who's that? 
Uh, and uh, that was the time that, that Feynman really realized that he'd got something nobody else had. And, and that was when he felt he'd won the, the Nobel Prize. And this is the paper by Case. Thanks, Dr. R.P. Feynman, for pointing out an error in the original manuscript. So that was when Feynman really understood that he'd got some new calculational techniques that nobody else had got, and that they really were powerful, and now they're used everywhere, as, as you all know. Um, the, the other thing, Feynman was a great, and I'll come back to teaching. Um, once he understood something, he couldn't resist telling you everything about it. So I was just telling John, uh, he had this thing about the pin statistics relation for electrons, and he'd take off his belt, and I remember sitting with him, and he took off his belt and tried to explain to me, uh, and he'd do it anyway. And I remember he was told by a, a waitress, no, don't take your belt off. <laughs> anyway, so uh, it was part of his technique was to try and explain to people and put it in language they'd understand. And he'd invent things just as I have now, like he said, hey, Slotnik. So he, he said, Dirac said to so-and-so, he said, hey, Pauli. Uh, of course, he didn't know that, but it makes things much more acceptable and appreciable. And he has a great technique of, of, of lecturing. The other thing I should say is you go into a Feynman lecture and you listen to all these things and you come out thinking, I really understand this. And then two days later, it's not quite clear mm -hmm. how you put them back together, but, but, uh, but it was a wonderful thing. Anyway, so it, it's, I realize a truly scientific paper would be of greater value, but such a paper I could publish in regular journals. So I shall use this Nobel lecture to do something of less value, but which I cannot do elsewhere. And basically he tells you, instead of, you know, doing all the clever stuff you did and then throwing away the scaffolding and showing how smart you were. And if you look at Schwinger's Nobel lecture, that's exactly it. It looks very polished and you'd have to work for months to understand what he did, all right? But, but so he told him all the things that he did wrong and, and where he went down this alley and that alley. And uh, it was, it's really, I do recommend it. Uh, and he said also, I ask your indulgence in another matter. I shall include details or anecdotes which are of no value either scientifically nor for understanding the development of ideas. They're included only to make the lecture more entertaining. So that's what I'm trying to do too, all right? Yeah. Not as good as Feynman. Okay, so uh, Schwinger uh, recognized that he and Feynman had the same results, but actually, in a sense, Feynman won. And this was a quote from Schwinger from his book on source theory, like the silicon pick chips of more recent years, the Feynman diagram was bringing computation to the masses. And so that was, so learning parallel computing without computers at Los Alamos, learning how to do calculations, uh, computations in, in quantum electrodynamics was his Nobel Prize work. And this is his, one of his long-term interests was the physics of computation. And uh, you can go back, there's a, 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 a hotel which used to be called uh, the Huntington Sheraton Hotel. It's now called the, I think it's the Langham Huntington Hotel. But it was where Feynman gave a lecture in 1959. It was after an APS meeting, the winter APS meeting on the West Coast. And it was an after dinner talk. So they all went off to the, the, the Huntington Sheraton and he gave a talk called Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And it was really about manipulating uh, in controlling things at a very small atomic type scale. You know, what, how small can you do things? So he was interested, you know, what are the limits of how, how small could you make it and so on? Uh, and he was not talking about, you know, making things, you know, on the scale of, uh, of normal engineering. He was talking about what are, what are the, how, much, how small can you go before you get down to atoms and things become much more, less real in a sense. Uh, what and, and it was not about are there new laws of physics? It's what could be done if the laws are what we think they are, but we haven't gotten round to it. That was really the thesis, and it's a, it's a lovely lecture. Yeah, I recommend you read it. Um, and in the lecture, he offered two prizes, and one was to the uh, the first guy who could uh, make an electric motor which was one sixty four inch cube. Unfortunately for Feynman. He was an amateur and he hadn't done quite enough work. It was too easy. And so within a year, a Caltech alum came up 
uh, it had lots of cranks come up, but this guy came up with a box. And the first thing he took out of the box was a microscope. And so Feynman realized that actually the guy was perhaps a serious guy. Uh, and he was, and he won the prize. Um, the Feynman had just got married and said, please don't do the next one because I can't afford it. Uh, and the second one was to the guy who would write a, um, essentially uh, the first page of a book on a tiny area, head of a pin type thing. And that took another 25 years. And it was, a uh, uh, you can read about uh, how, he, how he paid up. But Feynman called the guy in the lab and said, that said, is, is the prize still around? And Feynman said, yes, it is. What have you done? And so Feynman uh, was fascinated by it. And so you can read Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst, all engraved on, on, uh, on the microchip. And that was the second prize. So what Feynman felt was that in the year 2000, when they look back at this age, they will wonder why it was not until 1960 that anybody began to move in this direction of nanotechnology. And it's an interesting read. Um, experts like the people at IBM, Lars Landau and things, uh, you know, absolutely agreed it was exciting, but, but, but felt the Feynman was an amateur and they had some, some real professionals at IBM. But, but nonetheless, it was a really inspiring lecture and uh, it's one that I recommend. And, and then his connections with computer science continued, if you like. Um, it was a visit to Pasadena by two of the MIT uh, leaders in computer science, Ed Fedkin and Marvin Minsky, and they were on motorbikes, but they'd been at a conference, they'd rented motorbikes, they were going to go up to Mount Wilson, and off they went. And as they passed Pasadena, Ed Fedkin said, had been taught by Linus Powling, and said, why don't we call Powling and have a, go and see him and have a chat? And so they called him up and he was out. So that was no good. And so they said, well, who's this other guy? Fine, we don't know. Let's call him up and see if we can go and chat to him. So they did. And they went over and they chatted till the small hours of the morning and uh, about all sorts of things, about making things out of small components, linking back to that plenty of room at the bottom. And, and if you talk to Ed Fedkin, he will say the, the algebraic manipulation program at MIT was called Maxima. It, it was a, a forerunner of, of what, what Stephen Wolfram's SMP, which became Mathematica. Uh, Fedkin claims the origin of Maxima algebraic computing project goes back to that discussion. So that was uh, th when he first met Fedkin. Uh, he was the best man at Fedkin's wedding some years later. Uh, Fedkin also visits him about 10 years later. He was a Fairchild scholar here, and he wanted to work with Feynman. Fedkin wanted to work on something just called reversible computing. So you could do a calculation where you can undo it. You can calculate and you can uncalculate. And so Fredkin was upset by that idea. But the deal was that Feynman would teach Fredkin quantum mechanics if Fredkin would teach Feynman computer science. But as you'll read in that book, it's very difficult to teach Feynman anything, all right? He doesn't want to go and read a book with the answer in. He likes to be given some clues, you know, uh, and then figure it out for himself and then he gets stuck, he'll go and look at the back and go, ah, oh, yes, and, and try and, but he doesn't want to actually read somebody's complete solution. So it was very difficult to teach him. Uh, and in this time, Fedkin talked about these reversible gates. And the one over here is uh, uh, the Fedkin gate at the top. And I'll explain how these things work. And then the bottom is a toppery gate, which is a control, control, not. So if the two zeros, if there's a one on the top line, because A to A prime is a one, uh, and B to B prime is a one, then the C line acts as a knot. If, if, if one or either of them, or both of them are not, are not ones, then it doesn't do anything. And so that's a control, control knot. It's a complete set. You can build all gates out of that particular gate, similarly for the Fedkin gate. But we'll come back to that. And so um, he was persuaded to talk at a conference at MIT on the physics of computation. And Rolf Landauer, then IBM, was very pleased that he did because he gave credibility to the whole field. The physics of computation is an important area. Uh, and if you read his talk, he was asked to give a keynote. He said, oh, I see I'm supposed to be giving a keynote. I don't know what a keynote is. So said Feynman, all right. Um, and I'll leave what he said there 
to John to talk about in just a moment. But I'm just going to say a few more about how the lectures finally came about. So Feynman, Hopfield and me, John Hopfield had just come here. He was doing uh, neural networks with associated memory, not the neural networks we have at this moment, uh, the deep learning new neural networks. Uh, and uh, they were going to talk about physics of computation. Carver Mead, who did the, the VLSI design work uh, and Hopfield did the neural nets and Feynman was involved. But the first year he was doing a cancer operation. So Hopfield and me did the course themselves. And they, Hopfield thinks it was a complete disaster. That they were wandering over a vast terrain of intellectual uh, territory without a map. And so he never wanted to do it again. But Feynman came out of the hospital and said, Hopfield, why don't we go and do this course again? And so he was persuaded to do it. Uh, and Carver me was on sabbatical, but Carver gave a few talks, uh, uh, lectures in the end of the course. And of course, it was very popular because, you know, he'd get his friends like Marvin Minsky and Charles Bennett to come and give a talk. But one talk and the second talk was Feynman saying what Minsky did wrong, what, you know, everybody loved hearing Feynman's critique of, of the previous speaker. Anyway, so that was uh, uh, what happened. But they decided after that, that there were enough three courses and they'd go their own ways. And so Feynman uh, wanted to give a course called The Potentialities and Limitations of Computing Machines, which I'm afraid I retitled as the Feynman Lectures on Computation. This is his course outline. I hope, yes. So these are his Feynman's hands, these are his notes that you can see. And you can see that it talks about the theory of computer science, uh, the halting problem, Turing machines, finite states machines, uh, description of some real machines by Neumann machines, uh, physics of gates, error correction, and so on. And down on the, on the right, he talked about advanced applications like chess player, uh, vision, robotics, and so on, and, and uh, other, other engineering problems. So that, that was his vision for the course. Uh, and this is what it turned into. And I'm indebted to people like Eric who have done a lot of work on it, but it was actually all scattered around and it was quite difficult to put it together. And so this is the structure that I eventually gave it. Um, and uh, an introduction, then basic things about computers and gates, but it was, uh, as you'll see, it was slightly different from the normal gates because besides the normal logic gates, he had also reversible gates he was talking about and uh, uh, talking about, uh, reversible computers uh, and he did also Turing machines and he did uh, uh, other ones and then coding information theory gives a derivation of Sharon's theory talks about error corrections talks about the, the limits of computing due to thermodynamics which is not something that most people talk about uh, the limits due to quantum mechanics and we'll hear all about that in a moment and finally the limits to how you can make things on silicon and it, it, he was very much influenced by Mead and Conway's book uh, on VLSI. So that was the structure of the course and Eric can tell you more because he was actually there. Right? Uh, I thought I would just say a little bit about what was different. He'd learned a lot from Charles Bennett of IBM Research and Charlie had done uh, had realized that you can break the calculation down into a, in the computer into a series of steps which are each reversible and you could have physical reversibility of the entire calculation. And since the laws of quantum physics are reversible in time, you need to consider reversible computational gates in order to build a quantum computer, which we'll come to later. But the idea is this. So you have an AND gate and you have two inputs, one output, and uh, you've compressed the options could have been two, but it goes down to one, and that inevitably involves some energy loss. And what Bennett asked was, is that sort of energy loss inevitable? And what he found was that um, it wasn't. And if you did it carefully enough and slowly enough, like uh, in, in thermodynamics, a Carnot cycle, you could actually make it so that there was almost zero energy loss. And Feynman was, was very much taken by that because uh, transistor switching, instead of using energy KT log two, modern computers use 10 to the eighth more than that. And Feynman felt that was a really bad piece of engineering. And so how do you fix this? The AND gate's irreversible because if you have a one and a zero or a zero and a one, 
or to zero, zero, they all give the same answer, zero. So from the output, you don't know what the input is. And so you need, if you're going to do a reversible gate, you have to have an extra wire carrying extra information coming out. And that's what these reversible gates did. Um, instead of to emphasize it is reversible, instead of the usual not symbol, he used an X. And so the controlled not gate is these two lines coming in. And on the top line, if there's a, a zero there, the bottom line doesn't do anything. If there's a one on the top line, the bottom line acts as a not gate. And that's a controlled not gate. It's one of the first reversible gates in quantum computers. And then, as I said, he thought that engineers should be ashamed of themselves for doing it so badly and inefficiently. And then he talked about quantum computers, these quantum gates. And uh, in it, he discussed not that it could go faster than the normal classical computers, but, but it seems that you could actually make them smaller and smaller components. And you can make them, even if you had quantum mechanics with uncertainty principle, being challenged by Bennett to show that, that he could still do that. And so uh, he believed that there's no barrier to making it down, so it's quantum. And I got Charlie Bennett to write a paper, which was a long story, I won't tell you about that. Uh, but this is what he said in 99, I'm tempted to say that it's the fundamental scientific inquiry, it's finished, it's not be interesting anymore. Of course, you do have to actually make a quantum computer, but I think John will disagree with that. And so I look forward to John's rebuttal. Uh, Feynman also thought that uh, because uh, when testing quantum mechanics, it's superposition, but it's also entanglement, this action at a distance uh, that in Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, and Feynman was, was, was old enough not to be quite sure that there was a problem or not in quantum mechanics. But most people think now that decoherence is a satisfactory explanation, but he wasn't 100% convinced. So maybe you could find new changes to quantum mechanics, or maybe it'll be a billion dollar industry, which is what people are betting on now. Last few words, Feynman on computer science. He worked on the connection machine. Danny Hillis was sitting in Mervyn Minsky's basement and Carl Feynman was, was helping him with his thesis, which was on the connection machine. So Feynman agreed to go and work as a consultant and uh, did various programs, including writing a quantum chromodynamics program in a parallel version of BASIC, which ran on the connection machine. Uh, and for those computer scientists in the audience, this is Feynman on computer science. I hope. I hope. Oh, help. Yes. There should be a. Why have I not got a new sound? Oh, well. He says that I don't believe in computer science, is what it says. Uh, but it's entertainingly said. Uh, <laughs> lastly, Feynman is a teacher and SLN guru. So SLN is a place up, uh, uh, up the coast where people go and sit in uh, hot tubs in the night and discuss deep things. And Feynman enjoyed his time there. And he practiced using his technique. So this is um, sketchpanation, my son calls. He does these every week. This is his latest one, which happens to be about Feynman's learning technique, because I bullied him. Uh, so Feynman used to learn a topic and then try and explain it, and then realize that he hadn't quite understood it, so go back and make sure he could explain it even better. And then when he'd explained it and understood there were no gaps, he would then go back and, and change it. So he would introduce, you know, well, Dirac said, hey, hey, Schwinger, what are you doing there? And so on. He'd, he'd invent ways to make it more entertaining. And that, that was what Feynman did with computers. And so he talked to this very eclectic audience at Esalen, and he used his analogy of a computer. The inside of a computer is like a very dumb file clerk, but very fast. Feynman's legacy, uh, this was, I like this slide from the Caltech magazine, Four Kings and the Joker, all the five Nobel Prize winners. No prizes for guessing which one was Feynman. Uh, and I like this quote from James Gleick's biography. He believed in the primacy of doubt, not as a blemish on our ability to know, but as the essence of knowing. But doubt was essential. You have to, you know, we, we think we've understood this, but actually Newton's laws aren't correct when you get to high speed, you have to change it and so on. And it's nice when I went, used to go to San Francisco and that at one point there was this nice thing, think differently, Feynman on the edge of a building. So John, over to you.
I'm sorry, I took 10 minutes more than I did. All right, thank you, Tony. As Tony suggested, the quest for a practical quantum computer has roots over 40 years ago. And a pivotal moment was Feynman's 1981 talk at a conference on the physics of computation. Tony kindly invited me to contribute a chapter on quantum computing and how it's developed since Feynman's talk for the new edition of the Feynman Lectures on Computation. And that's also available on the archive if you're interested. I'd like to make some remarks about what Feynman said, but first, so we can appreciate his prescience, I'd like to offer some perspective on the status and prospects for uh, quantum computing. The way I look at quantum information science now is we're really in the early stages of the exploration of a new frontier of the physical sciences, what we might call the complexity frontier or the entanglement frontier. It's different than the short distance frontier we explore in particle physics or the long distance frontier of cosmology, but like those, it's very fundamental and exciting. We are now developing and perfecting the tools to create and precisely control very complex states of matter, highly entangled states, which are so complex that we can't simulate how they behave with our most powerful conventional computers or understand their behavior very well with existing theoretical ideas, and that opens new opportunities for discovery. Our Conviction that this frontier is fruitful to explore rests largely on two main ideas. Quantum complexity, which is our basis for thinking that quantum computing will be powerful, and quantum error correction, which is our basis for thinking we can scale up quantum systems to large computers that can solve very hard problems. And both of those ideas rest on an underlying concept, what we call quantum entanglement. That's the word we use for the characteristic correlations among the parts of a quantum system, which are different from those we ordinarily encounter. You might think of it this way. Imagine a book which is 100 pages long. And if it's a conventional book written in bits, every time you read one of the pages, you learn 1% of the information content of the book. And after you've read all the pages one at a time, then you know everything that's in the book. But suppose instead it's a quantum book, it's written in qubits, the quantum analog of bits, and the pages are very highly entangled with one another. Well, then if you look at a single page, you just see random gibberish, which provides very little information to distinguish one entangled book from another. And even after you've looked at all of the pages one at a time, you still almost know almost nothing about the information in the book. And that's because in the highly entangled quantum book, the information doesn't reside in the individual pages, it's encoded almost entirely in how those pages are correlated with one another. So that's the essence of quantum entanglement. It's very different from notions of correlation that we experience in everyday life. And what's so interesting is that those quantum correlations are extremely complex to describe in ordinary language. So for a highly entangled typical state of a few hundred qubits, if I wanted to write down a complete description using bits of all the ways in which those qubits are correlated with one another, I'd have to write down more bits than the number of atoms in the visible universe, which will never be possible. Now that in itself doesn't mean that by manipulating the quantum state, we can do something useful, but we do have reasons for thinking that quantum computing will be powerful. For example, we know of some problems which we believe are hard for conventional computers, which theoretically can be solved efficiently with quantum computers. The best known example is finding the prime factors of a large composite integer. And the computer scientists have given arguments saying that if we could do a modest sized quantum computation and then measure all the qubits to acquire a bit string, that by doing so, we're sampling from a probability distribution on bit strings that is hard to sample from by any classical means. But most tellingly, we just don't know how to simulate what a quantum computer does efficiently with a conventional computer. 
And it's not for lack of trying. Chemists and physicists have been trying for decades to come up with better methods for simulating complex quantum systems. But still, in the hardest instances, the best algorithms that we have have a runtime which increases exponentially with the number of particles. Well, it's a very remarkable thought that there are problems which are too hard to solve classically, but can be solved quantumly. Uh, we have a strong incentive to understand better what are these problems that are classically hard and quantumly easy. And we've learned some things about that in the last 25 years. I think we have a lot more to learn about that. And we will learn more when we have powerful quantum computers to experiment with. But if you're a physicist, there's a natural place to look for such problems because we expect that a quantum computer would be able to efficiently simulate any physical process that occurs in nature. So with quantum computers, we expect to be able to probe more deep, deeply into the properties of complex molecules and novel materials, and also simulate fundamental physics um, in new ways. For example, simulating the high energy collisions of elementary particles or the quantum behavior of a black hole or what happened in the early universe right after the Big Bang. But it's not a new idea, it goes back over 40 years, that quantum computers might be used for such problems. And we're just now getting to the stage where quantum computers are starting to do useful things. So evidently making a quantum computer is hard. Uh, what makes it hard is that we want a quantum processor to meet criteria that are nearly incompatible with one another. We want qubits to interact strongly with one another so we can quickly process the information encoded by the qubits. But we don't want the qubits to interact with the outside world, which would cause a quantum computer to crash. But we do want to control the computation from the outside and eventually read out a classical answer to a computational problem. Why is it so important that the quantum computer not interact with the outside world? It's because of the phenomenon we call decoherence which really arises because of a fundamental difference between quantum information and classical information, namely that you can't acquire information about a quantum state without disturbing it in some uncontrollable way. And so if we're trying to process information in a quantum computer, we can't allow any information to leak out. We need to keep the information that's being processed nearly perfectly isolated from the outside world and that's difficult to do because our hardware is always going to be imperfect. Uh, but we've understood in principle how to do it using the idea we call quantum error correction. And the essence of the idea is that if we want to protect quantum information from damage, then we should encode it very non-locally in a highly entangled state of a system with many parts. And then the environment may interact with those parts one at a time, but in doing so, it can't perceive the encoded information, just like we couldn't read that highly entangled quantum book by looking at one page at a time. So the information is protected. And furthermore, we've understood how to efficiently process quantum information that's encoded in this highly non-local way. So where's the technology now? There are a number of approaches to building quantum hardware that are steadily advancing. And it's important that we pursue these different approaches in parallel because we really don't have a clear understanding yet of what quantum technology has the best prospects for scaling up to large systems. A qubit can be instantiated in lots of different ways. It could be carried by the spin of a single electron, the phase of a single photon, the internal state of a single atom. Those are all remarkable encodings because the information is carried by such a simple, a simple single quantum object. And yet, thanks to decades of technological advances, we've learned to control those systems pretty well. Or a qubit can be encoded in a more complex system like an electrical circuit that conducts electricity without resistance at very low temperature, which is also very remarkable because in that case, the information is carried by the collective motion of billions of pairs of electrons, and yet we've learned to control it as though it's a single atom. 
It's useful to have a word for the era of quantum information processing that is now starting to dawn. The word NISC has caught on. It's an acronym. It means noisy intermediate scale quantum, where intermediate scale indicates that we now have quantum computers of sufficient size, say more than 50 qubits, so that we can't by brute force simulate with our most powerful conventional supercomputers what the quantum computer does. But noisy reminds us that these systems are not error corrected and the noise is a serious limitation on their current computational power. For physicists, NISC is exciting. It's giving us a new tool to explore properties of highly entangled matter in a regime we never had access to before. And it might have applications of broader interest, but we're not really sure about that yet. NISC isn't going to change the world by itself. It's a step towards more powerful quantum technologies we're expecting to develop in the future. I actually am confident that quantum computing will eventually have a transformative impact on society, but we're not sure how long that's going to take. Looking further ahead, we can envision applications of quantum computing to problems in physics and chemistry, material science, maybe also optimization, where we can outperform what the most powerful conventional computers can do in systems of just a few hundred perfect qubits, if the processing of the qubits were also perfect. Uh, but that's not what we have today. In today's quantum computers, every time an operation is performed on a pair of qubits, there's a probability of making an error, which is about 1% or maybe a little better. And we can envision that being improved to say one tenth of 1% in the relatively near future. But even then, to run these applications, which require a lot of gates performed in succession with sufficient accuracy, we would have to use quantum error correction. And there's a very high overhead cost so that in order to uh, perform applications that we think would be impactful, uh, we probably need thousands of physical qubits for each one of the protected logical qubits bringing the total qubit count up into the millions. And that's quite a leap from where we're likely to be in the next few years with systems with a few hundred qubits. Meanwhile, it's really important to try to further improve those gate error rates. And there are a number of ideas about how that might be done, which people are starting to explore in the lab. And they all have in common that to some extent, the protection against error is encoded into the hardware itself instead of handled higher up in the software stack. All of these ideas are in an early stage of development. We don't know how well they'll pan out, but it's really important to try because if we have much better gate error rates, we can do more useful things in the NISC era, and that will lower the eventual overhead costs of doing error corrected quantum computing. There are Two big questions confronting quantum computing. Now, how are we gonna scale up to the quantum computers that can really solve hard problems? And what are the most important applications once we do so to science and to industry? I consider both questions to be wide open. We really need a lot of research and technological development and time to arrive at conclusive answers. Nevertheless, I think the next few years are going to be exciting. We can expect to see dramatic progress towards implementing quantum error correction and taking steps towards more scalable devices. And with the programmable quantum simulators and circuit-based quantum computers that we have now and are going to be developing in the next few years, we can expect scientific discoveries because we're exploring matter, particularly matter far from equilibrium in regimes we never could before. And now coming to Feynman, um, the first person, as far as I know, who clearly articulated the thought that predicting the behavior of many quantum particles interacting with one another is beyond our computational reach uh, was Dirac in 1929 in a paper on the many electron problem. Dirac, by the way, was Feynman's scientific hero. 
He said the underlying physical law is necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are completely known. And the difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws leads to equations much too complicated to be soluble. And Feynman made clear in his 1981 talk that that was the challenge that he wished to face when he said the goal was the rule of simulation I would like to have is that the number of computer elements required to simulate a large physical system is only to be proportional to the space-time volume of the physical system. Nature can do it, can figure out how many particle quantum system should behave with resources scaling like space-time volume. We should be able to do the same with our computing machines. And then he explained the problem. If I want to describe a quantum wave function, of many particles, I have to assign an amplitude to all of the possible positions of those particles. Even if I discretize those positions, the number of amplitudes needed grows exponentially with the number of particles. And he said, therefore, because it has too many variables, it cannot be simulated with a normal computer. And then he asks, can you do it with a new kind of computer, a quantum computer? Now it turns out, as far as I can tell, that you can simulate this with a quantum system, with quantum computer elements. It's not a Turing machine, but a machine of a different kind. And in much of the talk, he discusses whether it's possible to describe and follow the evolution of a quantum system using a conventional computer which has access to randomness, which can flip coins. And he argues that, no, it's not possible. This is called the hidden variable problem. It's impossible to represent the results of quantum mechanics with a classical universal device. And then there follows a lucid discussion of Bell inequalities and the experimental evidence at that time uh, that they are violated, rather typically of Feynman. There's no references. and. Bell is never mentioned, but the thing that he's emphasizing is that we can't describe the correlations among parts of a quantum system using classical probability distributions where some of the variables are hidden from us. And that's the basic obstacle, that it's very difficult to describe highly entangled states of many particles in terms of classical data. Feynman reveals that part of what motivates him to think about simulating quantum physics with computers is the hope that that will illuminate the nature of quantum physics itself. Uh, he says, we've always had a great difficulty in understanding the worldview that quantum mechanics represents. It takes a generation or two until it becomes obvious that there's no real problem. It has not yet become obvious to me that there's no real problem. I cannot define the real problem. Therefore, I suspect that there's no real problem, but I'm not sure there's no real problem. <laughs> um, so Feynman suggests that a motivation for thinking about quantum physics computationally is that it can give us insights into the foundations. That's still a motivation for studying quantum information science today. And that's a vision that's still, uh, yet to be completely fulfilled. I don't know if anybody else in the room remembers this, but in 1984, Elena Spey gave a talk at our physics colloquium. Feynman, uh, do you remember this, David? Feynman uh, was sitting in the front row as he often did, and I was sitting next to him, and uh, Spey read uh, this quote from one of his slides um, it's not yet become obvious to me that there's no real problem, et cetera, et cetera. And then everyone was silent for a beat. And then everyone started to laugh out loud, including Feynman, which isn't the response I got from you guys. The best I could get was a couple of titters. So I probably didn't say it right. But anyway, Aspe was very uh, relieved uh, that Feynman was amused. And actually, Feynman later wrote a, a letter to Alain, um saying he'd appreciated the talk. Of course, he was talking about his rather new at that time experimental evidence for violation of Bell inequalities, which uh, was recognized by the 2022 Nobel Prize in physics that he shared with Clauser and Zeilinger. 
So Feynman very quotably concludes the talk by saying nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. And by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. And 42 years later, the quest for practical applications of quantum computing still doesn't look so easy. Now, to be fair, I should point out that there were others, a few others, talking about quantum computing around the same time, in fact, a little bit earlier than Feynman. One was the mathematician Yuri Menin, who in 1980 spoke about quantum automata and really emphasizes exactly the right ideas. He says the quantum phase space is much bigger than classical. He emphasizes that the dimension of Hilbert space grows exponentially with the size of the quantum system and says these heuristic calculations point to a much larger potential complexity of the behavior of the quantum system when compared to its classical imitator. So Manet is really hitting on the idea that it's just too hard to simulate a quantum automaton using a classical computer. And Paul Benioff was also writing about quantum computing in 1980. Um, Benioff was mostly interested in the issue of whether we can compute uh, without dissipation, which as Tony mentioned, uh, Feynman was also interested in, and so was Charlie Bennett. He didn't really discuss the idea that with quantum computers, uh, we'd be able to solve problems that are too hard to solve with conventional computers. So uh, 40 years seems like a long time, at least it probably seems like that uh, to some of you in the room, it's good to be reminded that big ideas can take a long time to uh, come to fruition. Uh, Feynman's 1981 talk is an expiring example of how a theorist looking to the future can set goals that future generations can respond to. And it continues to be an inspiration for the community of people who are still working hard to bring about practical quantum computers that will benefit humanity. So thanks a lot for listening. And I think Tony and I would be happy to answer your questions. Uh, Steve has the first question. Uh, question for Tony. Uh, do you think Feynman would have done as much work on uh, computing if his son hadn't gotten interested in computing? Well, that's, I, I, I know, I think he was genuinely interested for some time because he had this interaction with Minsky and Fredkin long before his son actually ended up working on the connection machine. So, uh, yeah, I think that was interesting that, that uh, he was very pleased his son changed from philosophy to doing computing. Uh, he was not very impressed by his philosophy. Yeah. And, uh, Could I add on to that? So. Uh, Feynman was very interested in quantum chromodynamics, and that's what he and I often talked about in the 1980s. Um, and uh, he was especially impressed by the idea of lattice gauge theory, that we can use classical computers to, uh, in essence, solve QCD when we can't uh, do so analytically. And uh, But there are some things that in QCD, you know, you uh, you can't solve with classical computers, and he was very aware of that. And so I think Part of what motivated him to think about simulating physics with computers was his, his interest in understanding how uh, the strong interactions really behave, which is a very hard computational problem. And that was one of the things he worked on with the connection machine, as, yeah, as you mentioned. He did. Uh, no, yeah. I agree. Uh, uh, in this lecture theater, I listened to Carl Bermead give a talk, and it was about how there were no engineering obstacles to making things chips smaller, faster, and cheaper for the next 30 years. He, Mead was wrong, it was 40 years, but um, but that was the reason why I switched to doing QCD on the lattice. And then I got more interested in computing than QCD, it turned out. Sorry about that. Well, Feynman said, you know, it was gonna be a long time before we have enough computing power to really have an impact on the physics program, which turned out to be true. And then the other thing was yeah. the Higgs was unlikely to be yeah. able to TV, and that was gonna take a long time to get right. there. So that was, I thought I'd do computing in the meantime. Right. Other questions? Yeah. I have more of a comment. It's kind of a snarky insult to Danny Ellis, which is I thought Danny several times about getting Feynman to work with the connection machine. He never mentioned Carl. 
I feel that was an unfair advantage to prepping on that connection. Yeah, you know, he said, yeah, oh, I mentioned yeah. presented this brilliant idea to find and find and said that I work there. It, it, it's, it's kind of funny that no, no, I, I, the connection came through Carl. There's no doubt that he did. <laughs> but but uh, when Hillis flew out here, uh, Feynman met him at Glendale Airport, which surprised Hillis. And uh, uh, so Feynman was clearly interested. But I, I absolutely agree. I think Carl deserves a little bit of credit for that. Yeah. Well, that's certainly true. But I think, as far as I could tell, Feynman and Hillis had a quite warm relationship. I think they did. Yeah. They did. yeah. Feynman used to, you know, when he was consulting, uh, he hated to be asked questions, what was his opinion on this? And according to Hillis, he used to say, that's not my department. But Hillis never figured out quite what was Feynman's department. <laughs> and when Feynman had discovered something, then he used, as I was saying, used to go around explaining to anybody to listen as to why it was this. And, uh, but I think he had a good time there. Yeah. I think there was somebody up there. Yeah. Two questions. Uh... One is, did Feynman have any favorite problem that he wanted to solve through these means? Uh, and uh, secondly, of course, one thing that Feynman didn't expect was artificial intelligence, all these deep learning, learning networks that we have today through classical computing. What is the future of that from your viewers' perspective? I'll say something, but it's probably for John as much as that. But, but Eric, uh, you see, was working with John Hopfield at the time of the lectures. Who was doing neural networks and Feynman? I, I, I forgot to mention someone I should have mentioned was Jerry Sussman, who was uh, visiting Caltech, and his deal was with Minsky that he would keep Feynman straight on computer science when Feynman gave this course. And uh, they used to have these arguments, as as you read from Eric's reminiscences over lunch in the greasy it was called then. Looks a bit more stylish now, but but uh, about. Uh, you know, whether symbolic AI or neural networks. And, and I get the impression that, that, that he favored some more practical things like neural networks rather than symbolic approach. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, that's fair, but uh, okay. I try to discuss both sides of that in the chapter. Yeah, no, indeed. <laughs> uh, Eric is now working on symbolic and neural networks, I should explain. Among the many uh, remarkable statements in that 1959 talk, uh, plenty of room at the bottom, uh, Feynman talks about uh, you know, what kind of emergent uh, capabilities we would see when computers have components that are so tiny that they're much, much larger. They just anticipate that you know, they would be able to, he uses the, the, the words, they'd be able to make judgments. Now, in Does he say that, Thomas? Street, that again? Yeah. No, I didn't know. Okay. But, but, uh, what, what have we? I'm not sure we've answered your question. Have we? No, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with John, but uh, maybe just if there are one or two favorite problems that he would want want to solve with uh, with quantum computing. Well, uh, okay. So the experience of how nature works. I guess. Yes, it's, I would have thought that that the person who would know that would be John, who was working with Feynman. But apparently, you never talked about quantum computing. Well, we did talk. We did talk about computation, uh, like I said, in connection with lattice gauge theory. And uh, one example of something he was interested in solving was to actually do a simulation from first principles of what happens in QCD when you bang two protons together at very high energy. And you know, uh, we have the capability, and already had it in the seventies. To solve part of that problem, you know, the really hard part of the collision, say when two quarks bang into one another, but all the soft stuff that causes hadrons to boil off, uh, that's still hard, too hard to compute from first principles. A quantum computer in principle can do that efficiently. Now in particle physics, it's done with phenomenological models, but eventually you should be able to do it from first principles. But you, but you also, you were working with Feynman when he had, you know, what problems on his board, you had well. So I was working with him is maybe an exaggeration, but uh, this was the it's last year of Feynman's yeah. uh, life. You know, the last blackboard. He said, "Solve every problem that can be solved," and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, what happened there is Feynman was interested in learning about integrable models, not exactly solvable models, and he thought maybe by piecing together perturbative QCD methods which uh, had become pretty mature by then with uh, 
the capability to solve certain models exactly, we'd be able to go further in the study of QCD. That didn't really pan out. But he want, wanted to learn about integrable models, and the way he decided to do it was to have a group of students that he met with every week. And so I had a lot of students, and so we were able to set it up. Uh, the students, of course, were delighted to have the opportunity to uh, have those weekly meetings with Feynman. He got very engaged in you know, trying to uh, solve uh, problems. Uh, and uh, you know, he gave this very typical of Feynman. He told the students to try to solve the, uh, uh, the six vertex model, which Baxter had solved, an integrable model, with, without looking at any references, any books. So they all worked on that for weeks together. Yeah before Feynman unveiled his solution, which... That was when Baxter, Baxter solved it by going from Australia to UK by boat, and he couldn't talk. Yeah, about see, we don't get a chance to do that anymore, no, no. Tony, and that's why we're not as good at solving problems. <laughs> I can have one thing about the question about uh, neural networks um, and classical computing, which is that I listened to discussions in which Feynman was at lunch at BC, in which Feynman was Quite interested in in <laughs> learning and the various kinds of problems that could be solved that way, uh, and I think it was connected to to Hockfield's arrival here. And uh, uh, the I I also put that chapter on archive if you're interested. Okay. So some sort of answer. Best we can do. All right. So I think we have a reception set up right outside bridge. Now, the plan was that there would be books on display. But there's one book on display. We have one book. <laughs> uh, the books are arriving tomorrow. Uh, you can get a plate, apparently. OK. Would you book plate? I don't know. I don't know what we do when the books don't show up. But we have these plates available. So if you want to, you can get it. And the books are arriving tomorrow, handily, uh, <laughs> and so that you can pick up your book tomorrow. But yeah. anyway, and, and uh, I should advertise, this is the book that I've been working on, AI for Science, which is much more important than all of this stuff, all right? <laughs> well, especially with the heart language models, maybe it is. So. All right, well, let's thank Tony one more time. <laughs>